we will start talking about the projective closure. Now, a final remark before we start talking about the projective spaces. Uh, just like we're writing Pn to denote the projective space in a field agnostic manner, and we use Pn of k to denote the spaces of lines inside kn plus 1, we're going to use the notation An to denote the affine space in a field agnostic manner. So An of k will just be the vector space kn. But just like in the case of the circle in the projective space, we can use An of other fields and even other rings. In fact, An is very easy, so An of a ring R will just be Rn as a set. Okay, with this uh, notational remark aside, we can talk about the projective closure. We start with a zero set of polynomials, let's say x, inside the affine space An, and we want to compactify this x. For this, we just choose an inclusion of an into pn, and usually you make the choice to either set the first coordinate to be 1 or the last coordinate to be 1 in the projected space, and then use the identification of the corresponding affine space. So I will choose the zeroth coordinate, so the first zeroth coordinate, and I will say i0 is the inclusion map from an to pn. That takes a point to 1 and that point. Now, if I take and x, the zero set of polynomials, in an, then I map x inside pn via this inclusion, and then I take its closure inside pn. And you take this closure with respect to whatever topology is available to you. If you're using rn or cn, then of course you have the Euclidean topology and you may take the uh, Euclidean closure. But um, of course the risky closure is more widely available, so you can use this also for the finite fields, and so you can also take the Zariski closure. So it's a fact of life that the Zariski closure and the Euclidean closure will coincide. So we will just continue working with the Zariski closure. And now here's an example, just we will take a line inside of A2 and then, well, embed this plane A2 inside A3 with, by setting the first coordinate the zeroth coordinate to be 1. Now you draw your line, and for each point in this line, you look at what the line this point generates with the origin in the three-dimensional space. And you uh, trace what happens as this point moves along the line in your plane. You see that the corresponding lines become horizontal, as we have discussed, and you see what the limiting object should be. You just have to add one new point, and this uh, new point is often called the point at infinity of this line. So you can compute the closure uh, using just the polynomials, but if we were to continue just with this example of a line, let's say in the plane I've taken the coordinate line x1 equals to 0. So x1, x2 are my coordinates in the plane, and I'm using x0, x1, x2 as my coordinates on the projective space. Then you will see that the new quote-unquote line is again the zero set of the homogeneous coordinate x1. So whenever this homogeneous coordinate is 0, it defines something that looks like a line on, on these affine charts. Now, there is a general strategy on how to compute the polynomials defining the closure. So let's do this next. Now let's take x to be the zero set of polynomials f1 through fm. So each polynomial fi is a polynomial with coefficients in k, let's say. And we want to compute the polynomials that define the closure of x inside of pn with respect to the embedding using the zeroth coordinate. And you can imagine uh, what's going to happen. And in fact, I suggest that you pause the video and play around with it. So what kind of polynomials in pn would vanish on this object? They should also uh, be somehow well defined. So you also need to have polynomials that scale well when you scale all coordinates. And that is essentially only possible when your polynomial is homogeneous. So every monomial in the polynomial is of the same degree. Then the homogeneous polynomial will scale uh, with the coordinates. Um, so if you scale the coordinates by lambda, then the polynomial will scale by lambda to the degree. Therefore, the zero locus would be well defined. So first and foremost, we are searching for homogeneous polynomials that vanish on the closure of x. And now here's the homogenization operation for the polynomials fi that defined x. What you do is that you write in place of each xi, uh, you write xi over x0. 
So you write a fractional expression. And then you scale the polynomial f by x0 to the power and to the degree of f. When you expand this out, or when you look at any of the monomials, you will see that the fractional terms in x zeros will be cancelled out, and that each monomial will now be of the same degree, the degree of the original f. So let's denote these things by capital F. So now x was the zero locus of fi's. I homogenize them with respect to x zero, as I described. These are, let's denote them by capital fi, and well, it's clear that each of these capital Fi's will vanish on the closure. So the Zariski closure is defined by the vanishing of such polynomials. And conversely, these polynomials will also restrict back to the little sm small letter Fi's. And it's an exercise to show that as a zero set, these capital Fi's will cut out the closure of X. In particular, if you're thinking topologically or differential geometrically, uh, the closure could be a complicated uh, object, but in this case, uh, we have an algebraic analog of computing the closure. Our zero locus was defined by polynomials, its closure also defined by the homogenization of those polynomials. And the homogenization operation is essentially trivial. And with this, uh, we've learned about how to compactify zero sets, how to simplify our life in particular. And now let's apply this to an example. A side remark is that you should, again, never be thinking exactly about the zero sets of polynomials, but the possibilities of all zero loci over all possible fields in which you can evaluate these polynomials. So we're really thinking of schemes, but I'm not using this word just yet. And that means when you're considering, let's say, the zero locus of a polynomial like x squared plus y squared plus 1 equals 0 over the rational numbers or over the real numbers, well, the zero set is actually empty. And well, you can homogenize this polynomial and the zero locus is still empty. So in particular, there's no contradiction. But nevertheless, you don't want to throw away the polynomial. You don't want to say that the locus you're studying is the empty set and call it a day. We want to keep track of the polynomial because one day we may want to evaluate this thing over the complex numbers. And then over the complex numbers, this polynomial does have a zero set. So this polynomial is different than the polynomial one, for example, which will never have a zero set. Keep uh, this in mind when you're doing your homogenization and don't throw out polynomials that look superfluous over R or Q, uh, unless you're committed to just finding out the set of points. You may actually end up destroying the scheme structure, this refined structure, which is very important uh, in doing geometry. Now it's time to do this example that I promised you at the beginning of the lecture, which is to compactify the circle inside the projected space and then count points. Well, uh, the circle was defined in the affine plane A2 was the equation x squared plus y squared minus 1. Let's call this little f. And I'm going to use as the third coordinate in the projected space P2, I'm going to use the letter z to denote the coordinate function. So now the homogenized polynomial, let's say capital F, is going to be x squared plus y squared minus z squared. And by definition, the Zariski closure of our circle inside of P2 is going to be zero set of this capital F. Now, uh, there is one easy way to count points inside of this closure of our circle. Let's call this C bar. And that way we will not do here, but in short, it will be to realize that this circle is in fact a genus zero curve with points on it. And then a genus zero curve with points on it is in fact P1. And on P1 over FP, well, it's very easy to count how many points there are. Uh, use the affine charts if you want. It's immediately clear that there are P plus one points. And so our circle will always have P plus one points. So that's one way to do this. Uh, on the other hand, let's continue with the elementary approach that we have started with. Uh, in that case, we already know how many points there are in the affine part of our circle. And the circle coming from the A2, which we started with. And so I just need to count how many points there are at infinity. So the infinity here is the complement of our affine chart. Uh, namely, we were working with the affine chart z equals 1. Now we're going to switch to infinity. This is the locus where z equals 0. And if z equals 0, now the coordinates can be represented by x, y, 0 in P2. And I additionally would like it to satisfy my polynomial equation 
x squared plus y squared minus z squared. Of course, z being equal to 0, I am left with x squared plus y squared equals to 0. Uh, now, x and y cannot be simultaneously 0 because z is already 0 and the point 0, 0, 0 is out. It does not generate a line. That means uh, I can scale by y, for example, so that my coordinates are now x over y, 1 and 0. And the polynomial equation that needs to be satisfied is that x over y squared equals minus 1. If our field does not have minus 1 as a square number, then of course there are no solutions here, there are no points at infinity. On the other hand, if our field has a square root of minus 1, then there are two solutions here, except for f2, which is easy to handle. Now add this result back to what we've computed for the number of points of the circle over fp, and you will realize that the if there was no square root of minus 1, then there were already p plus 1 points on the affine chart. We are saying there are no points at the infinity, so a total of p plus 1 points. If there was a square root of minus 1, then there were p minus 1 points at the affine chart. We found two more points, so that gives a total of p plus 1 points again. When p equals 2, you can just do this manually, you realize that there are three points. In principle, these points come with multiplicity 2 maybe, but let's not deal with this. So there are really three points again, that's again p plus 1. So uniformly we find p plus 1 points over any field uh, without any dichotomy like before. So this is a small illustration of the fact that compactification, uh, the risky closure in the project space, really is a good technique to simplify our objects. Let's revisit the circle and its closure now from the point of view of the rational numbers, real numbers, and the complex numbers. Of course, the discussion that we've already carried out suggests that there are no points at infinity when you're working with q and r because they do not have a square root for minus one. On the other hand, when working with the complex numbers, we get two square roots. And again, that means that our complex picture have to be compactified by adding two points corresponding to these two roots of minus one. We already knew that our complex circle, the affine part, looks like a cylinder. And I leave it as an exercise that the two points compactify the two open ends of the cylinder so that you get a sphere. Now, another way to treat the same problem is to well, continue to use the technique that we used in the first lecture for the complex circle. So there we projected onto the x coordinate. So the x-coordinate is in fact the line cut out by the equation y equals 0. So the equation y equals 0 makes sense also in the projective plane. It defines again a projective line and we can project our circle from an appropriate point at infinity, 0, 1, 0, into this projective line. So this gives again a 2 to 1 covering of this projective line, which we discussed before is in fact a sphere. So a circle our compactified circle will have complex points, uh, which is a complex manifold, that is realized as a 2 to 1 covering of the projective complex line, a sphere. And then we can argue, uh, just like we did in the first lecture, by making our branch cuts. This is only happening at the affine part anyway, so there's nothing that's disturbing us at the infinity. This time, however, we have two copies of a sphere with these two branch cuts. And then once again, we open up these cuts, stretch them out a little bit, glue them together, and then what we have is that two spheres glued together along the hose. Of course, this is topologically equivalent to a sphere. This also is in agreement with a remark that I made earlier, that the equation of the circle defines an, a curve of genus zero. The complex points of a curve of genus zero will be a sphere. And that's another way to see it. I leave it as an exercise to complete uh, the full description of the complex circle to convince yourself of the details that I've merely sketched out, and I will conclude the lecture here. Uh, next week, on Wednesday, we will continue with Grassmannians. So instead of lines in vector spaces, we are now going to look at m-dimensional spaces in vector spaces. These, just like projected spaces, are uh, crucial objects to do algebraic geometry, and from then on, we can do interesting experiments. See you on Monday, where we'll continue with a session on Magma.